what we have today is we have two on the preservation side and two on the production creation side. So given that this is a panel about preservation of a case study, we're actually going to have the two preservationists get up and um, present their work in preservation. And then we'll hear from you about your ideas. So Mark, why don't you go up? All right, great. I uh, just want to say a quick thanks for convening this and having me out. And the conversation has been really great today. And thanks to Kat and uh, the Hi-Rise team. Uh, it's been really nice to spend some time with uh, that work. Uh, yeah, so thanks. My name is Mark Beasley. Uh, I'm a developer at Web Recorder, uh, which is a project that uh, Rhizome is building to help preserve the uh, contemporary web. All right, so I just wanted to touch really quickly on a few of the, uh, the preservation projects at Rhizome uh, that have kind of informed Web Recorder's development. Uh, so the first one uh, that Zach talked about earlier today is called Old Web Today. So that's what we're, this project is sort of um, loading web archives uh, with uh, legacy emulated browsers in order to kind of show the web in its more original form for some of these old sites. And then the second project launched uh, just this last year called Net Art Anthology is again using emulated browsers uh, along with some other preservation strategies to uh, show sort of um, some of the works that have been made for the web over the last 30 years and sort of restage them. And so that brings me to Web Recorder. So Web Recorder is a tool to create high fidelity interactive recordings of any site you browse. Um, it's created by Ilya Kramer under the Rhizomes Digital Preservation Lead, Dragon Esper Sheet, and along with Design Lead, Pat Shu. Uh, it's fully open source uh, using open standards. Um, we have major support from the Mellon Foundation as well as additional support from the Knight Foundation. OK, so Web Recorder kind of provides a worm's eye view of the web. And what we mean by that is that it's very user focused and user driven. And so typically, web crawlers treat resources as a self contained unit comprising a URL and a timestamp. Uh, but the contemporary web is much more dynamic and complicated. So often, crawlers don't execute or fully process JavaScript, dynamic and embedded content, and aspects of client side rendering as well. Um, user context, such as logged in views or custom in, uh, interactions or like configurations on the website as well as uh, algorithmic-driven views or uh, location-based or durational-type websites. Um, so this is a quick diagram just to kind of show how Web Recorder works. Uh, so Web Recorder uh, sits between your browser and the live web, recording requests and responses as you uh, interact with the page. And so this is the record mode. And then so when you go to replay mode, uh, in replay mode, the page requests are then served from Web Recorder's local archive instead of the live web. Uh, restaging the browsing session and allowing for the same interactions that were performed in the source recording. So I just want to show a really quick example of recording my Twitter page. So you can load up Web Recorder, enter the URL that you want to record, and then once you log in, Web Recorder will start to capture the various page requests, like JavaScript, image assets, and the rest. And uh, you can see in the top left, the size incrementer is going up as those various things are captured. And so then I can interact with the page, for instance, looking at this tweet. Uh, and you can see the size inc incremented a little bit more. And so now I can go into re replay mode. So this is restaging that session. And now all this data is coming from web recorder servers instead of the live web. And it's a rich context so that I can go in and interact with the same things that I interacted with in the um, source when I was recording it. And so now all this stuff is loading from web recorder servers. And then obviously, if I interact with something that isn't in the web recorder, in the source recording, it uh, will not work. So you can see the error at the top. Uh, so this allows. The, for the preservation of rich uh, personal experiences of the web. So like Facebook pages, or your Twitter, or any other kind of like social media. And then uh, additionally, uh, we recently added uh, re remote browser support. So this is kind of building off of what we built for Old Web today. So um, the ability to capture uh, websites in emulated browsers that you know, so you could support like Flash or other plugins that are sort of unavailable or becoming obsolete in your sort of modern browser. I just want to show a really quick example. So, you know, when you visit a Flash site now, you get kind of like the opt-in, but soon that'll be not even the case where you won't be able to use Flash. So here I am choosing a browser that has a fixed environment that supports Flash. And I was going to record this Young Hei Chang piece called Pow Pow Pow. So I hit record, and what actually is happening is that uh, a remote browser is being uh, or an emulated browser is being launched, um, and it's sending that URL and it's recording the Flash site. So you can see at the top it's recorded four megs. And you can see it's kind of like a browser within the browser. And so now when I replay, that same session is available 
in a stable, sort of fixed environment so that this Flash page will always be accessible. So today we're going to be talking about high-rise and just uh, evaluating it really quickly and sort of checking the various projects. There are already some initial issues that I see, you know, for instance, um, in the Universe Within project, when you're at this sort of the host selection mode and you choose a host, uh, you get this alert message that says parse.com is shut down. So right away there's some sort of like evidence of like link rot or service rot where the code was making a call out to parse.com and now parse.com is shut down. So preservationists trying to preserve this piece are going to have to like go back and reverse engineer what that functionality was or comment it out. So um, again, like Web Recorder can help prevent these kind of situations by creating rich uh, interactive uh, versions of the sites. So here you can see I'm interacting with actual recordings of two of the projects from HiRISE. And these are both being replayed from Web Recorder, so coming from Web Recorder servers. And all the sort of interactions and the various um, details are there. Um, and so also preserving is not also generally about the, the site itself, but it could be the context around the site. So um, HiRISE had a sort of participatory aspect where like, there's a Flickr pool here where users were contributing photos. Or in the New York Times piece, there's these comments. Um, or also in Facebook or other social media, there's like viewers uh, sharing and engaging with the work. So it's important to be able to capture all these various different contexts. Um, so current and future work, uh, we just launched a desktop player. So that'll be available, or is available now to download. And that allows you to be able to download your uh, recordings and play them from your desktop without an internet connection. Uh, we're expanding our emulation work to include more browsers and uh, even new environments. Uh, discovering annotation, so being able to find new um, other people's recordings and collections. Uh, and then we're uh, improving our live streaming video support, so being able to use or record and replay live streaming video. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Next, we have Marc Romier, who will talk about his work at Ubisoft. <laughs> <What? Hello? laughs> uh, thank you for inviting me as well uh, to the MIT and the Centre Phi. So yeah, I'm Marc Bromoulet. I'm working at Ubisoft as the Enterprise Content Manager. So basically my mandate is to make sure that uh, anyone internally finds the right content at the right time. Uh, and to make sure of that, like we have to ensure that the key content is identified, organized, is easily accessible and reusable. So the preservation is part of the mandate that I have for the team internally. To do so, I have a team of around uh, between 13 to uh, 15 people working uh, with me on this, uh, on three different aspects, uh, product management, product owner. So we are working with uh, dev team internally to uh, deliver uh, tools in order to manage efficiently our content. Uh, tools like an enterprise search engine, we have an internal uh, social network, uh, we have an internal YouTube-like video platform. Uh, so we are developing mainly our own tools as well. Uh, we have also some people working as content strategies, so the purpose of this team is to make sure that the content is well organized, no matter the place. Uh, so it's well structured with the right metadata, with the right convention naming, and so on. And com community manager, and their mandate is to promote key content, key knowledge, in order content to be reused, because preservation is in itself not a goal. It's also a way to, uh, to make sure that the content at the end is reused, uh, to innovate, to save time. And the community manager has to promote this content, to curate this content internally. And I will show you afterwards like the kind of platform that we have and how they are using uh, this platform. So I've been working at Ubisoft for seven years now. And uh, yeah, still growing the, the company now as about uh, 12,000 people uh, around the world. So it's like it grown a, we've grown a lot, a lot in the past few years. Um, you have to know as well that uh, one project like, uh, like Assassin's Creed can uh, reach up to 1,000 people in uh, eight studios, around eight studios, uh, working for two years or three years on the, on the same game. So it's kind of a challenge to make sure that they access to the right content, to the right assets. And, uh, and yeah, so 80% uh, of them are, um, are in production. And uh, yeah, I'm working here in Montreal, close to the teams, close to the people who are doing these uh, amazing games. And uh, they are knowledge workers, so we have to take this into account. Their job is really to, uh, to create assets, to like they are all creative and to, to produce these games. And knowledge is our raw material. So I'm part of the knowledge management team, knowledge and learning team. So really like not only manage content, but knowledge. 
And uh, yeah, so um, like we've said, uh, it's up to 70 million budget for a, a video game. So it's uh, a lot. So we have to be efficient as well, more and more efficient as well, regarding the way we are managing this content. Uh, so internally, we have to embrace chaos, because since it's a lot of information, a lot of content, uh, at some point, you cannot manage everything. You have to focus on the key content that you want to really organize. It's just few figures, but I can take a lot of other figures, like the amount of assets created on a game. For instance, in the last For Honor game, it was on the business side uh, around uh, 80,000 assets created on the production. It's 110,000 assets created. So it's a lot to store, to manage. And uh, at some point, our user is, uh, is a bit lost because we have a lot of tools, a lot of place to manage this content. So this is the role of my team to make sure that we will organize efficiently all of this content to, uh, to preserve it. So first, it's about an intranet to browse all the key knowledge and documentation. So concretely, it's like at Ubisoft, you can access this kind of web page. So as you can see on the top uh, header, it's part of the knowledge center. So we have a knowledge center where you can access all the previous games that we've done internally. You can filter on the platform. You can filter on the, on the different studio. And you can get access to it and all the documentation related to it. So whenever you want, you can get access to it and be inspired by all of what has been done by other fellow workers like working on other games, like for instance, Rainbow Six, one of the most successful games at this moment of Ubisoft, uh, where you can uh, have information related to the game in itself, like all the metadata, but the different gates. Uh, it went through the different studio collaborating on it. But also, since we are part of the knowledge management and the documentation is key, we are talking a lot about the documentation, is there what you will learn, like stuff related to the game, how they, they did that to get the big picture. So it's a collaboration post-mortem, it's like the feature list that they have. And, uh, and so, for instance, you see on the right uh, side in front of the documentation that we have 300 uh, items. So in order to do so, we have a list of key content that we want to, uh, to highlight, to aggregate as part of this uh, platform, because we won't keep everything, obviously. And uh, it's there that we'll have all the key content, the key documentation stored. And depending on your job, you can always uh, also uh, browse it and uh, see what matters to you. Uh, you can see also on the top that you have the overview content, but also contacts. So it's also people that who worked on the game, uh, the technologies that they are using. So it's a lot about the, the reuse. Uh, we have also um, uh, a search to access closing kit on the master archive. Since we are mainly keeping the documentation and uh, the stuff that you need to be inspired, uh, we are not keeping all the assets available, all the code. To do so, we have an enterprise search uh, that allows you to get access to it, to request an access uh, to it. But most of the content, the data is stored so in a low perf server, and we are not keeping available all the content, obviously. But, uh, but still, you have a search engine to look for, for this content and request an access to the closing kit or to the master build. And finally, it's a process. So uh, most of our productions are following the same process from a workshop conception to production and operation. So what we are trying to do is to also tell them, depending on your job family, what are the, the actions that you have to do on the deliverable, the content that you have to aggregate. Uh, so for instance, if you're an audio designer lead, all along the process, uh, you will have to make sure that you will uh, store this kind of content, like budget assets, dialogue, music, audio conception. And this is the key content that we will make sure that we will uh, keep for all the long run uh, on the knowledge center and internally. So to sum up the things a bit, uh, really our, our policy is to make sure that we have a right place to browse all the key knowledge, the documentation. Uh, it's also to archive all the key data in a standardized way uh, and to provide a search to access it. And it's a lot about the right process, incentives, and team to support your content preservation strategy. Because obviously, uh, it's, not, it's not even enough like having 15 people to manage all the content. So we have to rely on the team, the team lead, the producer, to make sure that they will understand why it's important preservation to manage the life cycle of a content from the beginning to the end. And, uh, and to do so, we have to make sure that we have incentives uh, and uh, yeah, we are helping them on the day to day to do so. This is it. Excellent.
Thank you. And next we have Marianne, who's going to talk about preservation at Arte. Yeah, we, I'm, I'm Marianne Lévy Leblanc. I'm working in uh, the web department in uh, Arte France, uh, based in Paris. And uh, we've been producing interactive things uh, for roughly 10 years. I'd say we have been involved in something like 70 to 80 different works, uh, very diverse. And um, um, the, I think the thing to keep in mind uh, in the way we approach this issue is that we have this uh, double mandate, uh, both as a co-producer, meaning commissioning or co-commissioning uh, production. We um, uh, then are a partner both for financing and uh, editorially, but we're also a media and we are publishing, distributing the works we co-produce. Um, what, what that means is that we're not uh, the owners of uh, our production. We co-own them with their producer and other partners. Um, and the other thing is uh, the kind of model for co-production we rely on, inherited from audiovisual French models is, and that's not only French, is um, we acquire a licensing right for a limited time and limited territory, which means that when that expires, the question of what happens uh, uh, arises, and uh, probably um, that's something we hadn't foreseen at the beginning, so we are now really uh, fighting with uh, this issue. Uh, in France, there's uh, this um, uh, dépôt légal, like legal deposit uh, system, which means that uh, every uh, work of thought and uh, audiovisual uh, art is uh, uh, preserved by the National Library and p with, in partnership with uh, the National Institute of Audiovisual. So what they do with um, uh, the web is that they scan web, simple web pages, so that's kind of taken care of. But for really uh, research academic uh, uh, consultation and not for the general public. So we're left with all the rest, uh, which is now a huge part of what we do produce. What I see now as a number of issues um, is one, the kind of tension we live in between a real um, encouragement to innovate, use the last technologies, uses, tools, devices, which is in a way um, absolutely opposite to the idea of accessibility and preservation. So that's, that's really an issue. Another thing is um, there is the currently uh, structuring of the professional scene in France. Producers are, um, interactive producers have created like two years ago an association which makes them a kind of um, proper um, group to talk with, with the different French protagonists of uh, this issue. And uh, another last thing is that um, within our team, we started very modestly to produce video games recently. And uh, that's been a really interesting school of, um, uh, to, to learn some methods of uh, whether um, maintenance or preservation. But one huge reason for that is that there's suddenly a commercial uh, stake for the work. Uh, and that's still very marginal among what we do because essentially we produce uh, based on public money for the public and we distribute free works. But obviously it's not because it's free that it has no value, so we're like left with the question. Excellent. Thank you. And Uk, why don't we talk about NFB? So, yes. Uh, um, I, my name is Uke Sweeney, I'm executive producer. I run the uh, interactive uh, studio in Montreal. Uh, the NFB is an almost 80-year-old institution. Um, we took a digital shift at the end of the 2000s. Now we've produced, in, in my studio, we've produced more than 60 uh, different pieces. A um, lot of web stuff, but also mobile stuff, installation, um, we do VR, AR, we're doing something that's going to come out this year in Messenger. So we're doing something on Twitch. 
so there's a very wide variety of platforms and form and content. Uh, so it's a bit like the a sand, like you're trying to grasp it and it always goes between the fingers. Um, and the array is so large, like at, at one extent there's like HTML5, a uh, very simple project that you can really encapsulate. And at the other end, we did a project where we took the um, uh, stories from people in the neighborhood and that the was translated uh, into scarves. So what do you do with the scarves? <laughs> so for me, the, 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 there is a, that being said, in the mandate of the NAB, we need to archive what we do. And with film, we know how to do, do this uh, very good, like we can, like good 35 milli millimeter in the appropriate condition can be kept for like 1,000 years. And this is not a joke number, it's a real number. Uh, so, and there's been challenges throughout the decades, like even the beginning of the video uh, production at the beginning of the 70s uh, brought very important uh, uh, challenges and digital in the 80s, etc. So with the interactive work, uh, the goal, the first, it's like a multiple layer thing. Like I think the first thing is to make sure that all the assets are um, secured properly which is the case, like all the different sources of every part of the project separately need to be kept appropriately. So that's the first layer. The second layer is to document the experience properly because there is there are, there are living organism, if I can say, which we kind of do OK, that we could do better. And I almost feel like smarter, like more the day advanced today. I get like ideas and <laughs> OK, that we could do that. And OK, no, that's a good idea. And the third layer is really to reactivate the production at any moment in time, and that's the, the most hard part. Um, for me, the challenges is really about accessibility versus archival. It's really hard to think 50 years ahead when you have difficulty to think five years ahead. And even like in, a, in, a, in, a, in a period where the project is still active and technology is broken, so it brings you to the second challenge, which is a money challenge. Like, what, do you put a, a dollar in like new ideas and new audiences and new stories and project, or you put it in stuff you already done to make sure that they're, they're going to be accessible. Um, and the other challenge, I guess, is yes, to, to do scarves and HTML5, just that to not constrain uh, creativity by uh, archival process. So it's always like a kind of a dilemma. Excellent, great. And we're lucky enough to have the director of High Rise here with us, who's going to now come up and present High Rise, Katerina Sizek. Thank you. It's, it's really an honor to have High Rise um, as a case study here at this, uh, this fabulous uh, conference. And I feel like we've already done some of the work <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the first half of this, this panel. Um, but I thought I'd just um, go through the project quickly uh, and, um, and just give you a sense of the, uh, of the kind of cross-sect the, pro cross the project in a few different ways. Um, and just to give you a quick background on me, my name is Kat Cizek, and I'm now with the MIT Open Documentary Lab. And I'm there to launch an emerging new studio, uh, which is not unrelated to the preservation of some of the ideas of High Rise. Uh, it's a co-creation studio. So, um, uh, but for seven years, I um, worked at the National Film Board of Canada with two producers that are here with us today, uh, David Oppenheim, uh, I did the last um, iteration of High Rise with, and Jerry Flahive, who, who um, helped uh, create the whole, the whole project from the beginning until almost the end. Um, and just to give you a sense of the scope of the project, uh, the kinds of um, critical acclaim it received, and uh, the kind of press, uh, the users, and the scholarly citations, this is uh, for the project as a whole. Um, but this kind of, this is a map that uh, sets out the actual individual editorial story elements of the project. So 2008 to 2015, um, the idea was to take the high-rise building as a storytelling prism, storytelling prism for, for, the, for the 21st century, to look at some of the biggest issues of our time through this, this very vernacular uh, building that so many of us just drive by in so many of our cities. Um, so some of it was done very locally on a local scale in Toronto, Ontario. Uh, and then we kind of uh, uh, spanned out into a global vision of, of the high-rise bu building as being a ubiquitous uh, expression of globalization. 
Um, so I'm going to just break it down quickly by story, by platform and technology, by assets and by process. And I'll, and I'll leave the panel and, and the audiences with one uh, special question that I have looking back at this project. Um, by story, so there's, there's basically uh, five major digital documentaries that were made uh, over the course of seven years uh, in, in using various different platforms that I'll talk about later. But um, I'll, I'll just show you clips from three of them to give you a sense of the aesthetics and, and, and some of the editorial uh, content. Desde mi ventana, eh, por la mañana me gusta pararme y ver el mar. También me gusta, según como usted el día, ver el mar, llegarme hasta Bolivia. Ah, uh, that's, I, I cut it off, that was my fault. Um, the next one is Universe Within, which is the last one. High rises are a kind of metaphor for the way we live today, physically together, but very much apart. You shut the door to your apartment and connect to the world through the internet. I, uh, in my apartment, I have a laptop, my iPhone, a table, and three chairs. Sometimes I picture the internet as a spider web and all these little bugs trying to get out. And the next one is a, a collaboration with the New York Times. Um, so it actually sits, unlike everything else at High Rise, which sits at and National Film Board of Canada, uh, this one is actually on the New York Times servers. The new luxury high rise places are getting smarter, greener, taller, while the new low rent trend downtown is to make the units smaller and smaller. So in terms of platforms and technologies, I don't think I've even listed them all here, but it, most of the projects that you've seen there, those are all digital in-browser experiences, built-in Flash, WebGL, uh, HTML5, um, a lot of APIs, uh, for example, in, um, in uh, One Millionth Tower, we bring in a weather API from Yahoo. Uh, we used Flickr as the foundation for user-generated content. Um, Google Street View, we, were working, uh, we worked with DepthKit, um, which is now a scatter studio in New York City. Um, but outside of the browser, we also uh, used uh, a lot of um, uh, custom technologies like Touch Developer. We had installations, live performances, worked on radio and print. Um, this here is uh, a prototype of, um, of uh, 360 uh, that we shot in Cuba, uh, thanks to Casper, actually, uh, who set us up with Yellowbird, um, a Dutch company that took the uh, Google Street View camera and um, rigged it to capture 24 frames per second, effectively uh, capturing some of the first 36 uh, degree technology available directly online, streaming online, that we featured in Out My Window. Um, this is the project I talked about where we've got weather API coming in from Yahoo uh, to situate you in the weather conditions of, of the current uh, situation of the high rise that we, we did this project in, in Toronto. Uh, this was the Flickr project, a uh, participation project where uh, users could upload through Flickr. Um, and then we transformed out my window uh, into a large installation again, thanks to Casper at IDFA for one of the first installations there. Um, and it looked like this. It was an eight meter wide screen. We took all the assets uh, from, or many of the assets from out my window and um, reformatted them in Touch Developer to present uh, uh, a live inst uh, an installation. That's what that looked like. We also ended up being approached by the Toronto subway system to do an installation, uh, can you imagine, of a documentary film as posters. Um, so uh, one million uh, riders a day uh, would come by our posters uh, for two months. These are the residents of the high-rise building seeing their work for the first time uh, at, their, at their, the nearest uh, metro to their, to their high-rise in, in Toronto. 
We also have done uh, quite a few live performances. This was Universe Within, um, premiering at Hot Docs, where we rigged the host of, our, uh, of the live show, Misha Gloverman, with, with the Connect rig and used Depth Kit to project him directly on screen to, um, to go through uh, the first iteration of Universe Within. We also did a three-hour remote uh, radio broadcast from the buildings that we worked in uh, with uh, Toronto's morning, uh, morning uh, host. This is the New York Times user-generated site, so again, another kind of platform. Um, the other way to look at high rise would be just the assets, and I think you made an excellent point about, uh, I think several people actually have made the point of being able to just collect all those assets and having them available for migration, for creative treatment. Um, tens, uh, tens of thousands of photographs, um, and I think Jerry, uh, Jerry Flahive, uh spent a lot of time throughout the project making sure that um, there wouldn't be uh, a short lifespan on those photographs. So uh, I'm working very closely with the photographers um, to make sure that they were in perpetuity with, with the National Film Board of Canada, which was a big job. Um, there's many short films, many collages. Uh, there's a lot of journalism that's been written about the project, not about uh, like press coverage, but we worked in tandem with numerous uh, publications uh, to create additional content and additional editorial work around uh, some of the launches of the projects. A lot of academic papers as well. We worked with an academic team. An academic book is due out uh, this year uh, associated with High Rise. These are some of the collages that we built the, um, the live installations with because they were just so high res and so huge. We thought they might look great eight meters wide. So those are available in our in our uh, assets. The other way, and I think this for me is the most important way to think about High Rise, is the process itself. And uh, High Rise was a project inspired by the methodologies of the NFB Challenge for Change program, which happened throughout the 60s and 70s at the film board, um, which involved using film and video uh, to, to uh, imagine uh, community revitalization and policy change. Uh, so instead of making films, making, um, uh, making tools for change. So a lot, of the, a lot of the things we did in High Rise were inspired by this. So we did five years of participatory projects with High Rise residents in Toronto. This is some of their work. They did photo blogs and presented them live. We also have documented a lot of our production tools, our protocols, our ethics. A lot of our projects went through research and ethics boards at universities. Um, and we had toolkits that we worked with uh, remote teams around the world and at my window, for example. Those are all part of the project, the spirit of the project. Um, the education team at, Hi at uh, NFB uh, built extensive and elaborate education toolkits that in themselves won awards around the world um, and have been used extensively in Canada and beyond. Uh, the, there's a, one af associated with the New York Times project as well. We did uh, community projects training uh, people in the high rises. This was a coding workshop for, um, for girls. The, uh, these two girls had just arrived in Canada two months uh, earlier from Iraq, and they built a game by the end of the afternoon. Um, and again, I won't go into detail, but a lot of um, methodologies that I think are really uh, both inspired by the technology and contribute to uh, a 21st century way of, of making this kind of work that I think is so, so crucial to this project. Um, and finally, a manifesto uh, of, of the approach. We can, we can share this with you later on. Um, but I guess the big question I have uh, to the panel and, and to you all and to myself is um, uh, to, to Brett's, Brett's idea of this being a spiritual question. Um, it's not just about uh, preserving the sum of the parts of a project, but how do you approach it as a legacy and as a whole, um, much like uh, what Vincent showed us today? How can we, um, how can we zigify High rise. How can we resurrect, resurrect uh, the zig in high rise? So that's that's my question to you. So thank you so thank much. You. <clears throat> so we're going to hold on to that question. And first, I'd like to ask the panelists what interests them about the high rise challenge. This is clearly an elaborate ecosystem, as William would say, and perhaps several elaborate ecosystems. So I'd love to hear from you what you're thinking when you see this challenge of the high rise. 
Why don't you start? Yeah, yeah, it's so multifaceted in so many different technologies and it's very lots of engagement and user part participation, participation <laughs> and yeah, user generated content. So I find all that super exciting. And yeah, being able to capture all that seems like it'd be really valuable for this, like, you know, for the final kind of object or however it sort of, yeah, is saved. And with the web recorder, you had mentioned that you want users to start yeah, learning exactly. how to use yeah. it. So so it'd be, and so, yeah, that? there's so much excitement around the project. And it seems like people, even just like the Flickr pool had like, like hundreds of uh, contributions. So there was like obviously a lot of investment and interest in the project. So you could also like ask users to preserve their aspects of it or like sort of curate their own or make their own little like sort of little yeah mini versions of it or like the things that impact them and be able to like share and have that be a part of it. Great, excellent. And Mark, how about you? This is a big database. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of content type as well, like uh, yeah, same like we've said previously, it's a lot of technology behind, a lot of content type, so it's a lot of complexity behind and uh, how to manage it efficiently. So it's very interesting. And how to relive the experience, something that we face in video game as well, like uh, so. And how do you think you would go about that, like trying to relive the experience with? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> okay. We'll have a lot of questions today, maybe not so many answers. And Marianne? This is a really multifaceted project. And in a way, it's uh, kind of self-documented, partly. Um, from a... Um, from a media perspective, uh, I would um, ask the question of what um, what makes sense to be preserved at a certain time, and um, what what should remain uh, accessible in it. I mean, part of it is just life. So, has it got to be preserved? I'm not completely sure. Another question is something which um, I mean, uh, an actual question for all the protagonists of the project. Um, it raises uh, issues that are really similar to uh, traditional film documentary, which is the relationship with the characters and participants of the project. Um, when a film is being done with characters, you make um, um, a formal deal with them of the way um, their life at a certain moment uh, in their life, in time, will be documented and and made accessible for a general audience. When, like 20 years later, the film continues to travel in festivals, it's a very small and contained audience, so that basically doesn't raise any problem. But if you maintain that online, we're talking about something really different. And my experience from a broadcaster's point of view is that you cannot mess with that. Uh, the question of whether the people in documentaries in general want or not to be um, shown publicly 20 years later is really a question. Yeah. And is that something you ask people and you have your producers ask when they're I mean, that's working? kind of basic yeah. rule for documentary production. You ask people their authorization. And it's documented so for the yeah, preser and, and, preservation. And that's, that's um, uh, with, with really precise parameters of uh, when and where uh, the result will be shown. Yeah. Excellent. And Uk, what do you think well, is interesting about this? The, how um, rigorously it's self-documented, it just tells how we should be more rigorous about self-documenting when we do stuff. Uh, that's one thing for sure. The other thing is like how, how do we uh, archive or preserve the users or the, the audience because for me the difference if there's like one specific distinction about interactive documentary or uh, interactive narrative is that there's somebody at the center that is doing something may it be a game may it be a website whatever a project like that a participatory approach you're contributing you're moving a mouse whatever and that person is in the mind of the creator, the artist, the production team, like all the way through from the intention to uh, the exploitation of the piece. So how do we encamp uh, archive that? And we don't do that. We, we tend to be very focused about uh, what we produce, but not very focused about the, pe the people that will play with it. And 
so it can be about the common the comments that are raised like right right now we have a social media uh, story that kind of make people react in a very strong way and it's interesting how it it's interesting how it unfolds throughout days so even that but like also like at some point we had like the blabla Bla project from Vincent Mercier that some morning he sends me like a, somebody at the, the other end of the world that is filming yourself play blah blah and reacting like that should be part of a memory of a project in 20 years from now so and i think that's inspired inspired a lot by what caspar is doing at the club with the how you show a web piece for instance in a concert venue um we did we do more and more like a physical manifestation of our project so inter it's interesting because you can bring audience on the stage for the insomnia project for instance people came on stage and answering insomnia question live in front of 80 people with a musician playing at the same time and we kind of document that so it's interesting how you get the intim intimacy and uh, the input of the people and for me that's a, a central element that we need to uh, to shape a bit more and understand how, how we do that and do you have some thoughts that you know, you've been thinking today about ways to capture user experience well i think the, the there's a part like i like what brett said about like don't try to make it accessible like through eternity just wrap it, wrap it up in the, the appropriate manner at some point and I think like for me it's like I don't know like documenting 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 like how do you document with text pictures video even like one thought since we talked about this preparing for today I think a lot about the the books we make in like a museum art exhibit as a leave behind just to keep a, a memory in time of that exhibit because there are content of the piece, but also a look on the piece from third parties, may them be curators or academics or whoever, because there is so, so much a, a sense of timeliness to what we do also, like what will it mean, like apart from the technology and making, what will it mean in 50 years from now to tackle like the high rise problematic or I don't know, like the insomnia thing, like what what does insomnia will mean in 200 years from now? I have no idea. So it's more about documentation, yeah. That and leads to my next question is really what is preservation for you um, all? Uh, you know, we've had a whole day of thinking about preservation. We've heard many different types. We have documentation, we have emulation, migration, reinterpretation, and many different theories around it. And I'm curious from each of you sort of what preservation means to you, how you define it. My perspective of just like Obviously, these objects don't live in a vacuum. So, being able to like capture some of the life around uh, the documentaries or like interactive sites would be uh, really amazing. Like, uh, in, for instance, with high rise, being able to capture like uh, you know condo sale sites or you know like discussions about people with, or discussions of public housing on like you know news sites or uh, people talking about rent stabilization or like all these other like you know uh, aspects of that are kind of incorporated into the work so that those could kind of live on beyond with the piece itself. Um. That's great. Yeah, to me it's about like content retrieval and like how to organize it in a way that it would be accessible. We talk a lot about accessibility and this is key to me as well because like we are not producing stuff just to uh, archive it and go somewhere and maybe someday somebody will reuse it. Like a video game, like when you look at the amount of money that it will require to do a game, so you cannot reinvent the wheel again and again. So preserving is not only capturing the collective intelligence of the company, it's obviously also like making sure that this content is there so that people can reuse it to save time, but to innovate as well. And obviously to remaster a game since we have like 30, 30 years of games before, like there is plenty of the same game that we are remastering to the to the console, so preserving is also a way to do money for us, and it's yeah, it's true. That's great. And either of you? Yeah, I mean preservation is. Um, um, uh, I suppose it's 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 an old story, and and what's in my mind specific here is uh, the, the uh, freedom of use. Many of the work we're dealing with uh, has. Um, and so you want, I mean, what you want to preserve is something quite immaterial. Um, and um, there's also, um, I don't know, I suppose we're coming, well, there, there, there's something like a, a growth crisis, can you say that in English? Where we've spent some years doing things, I mean, video games is not like 
very new, but um, and suddenly there's a kind of panic with time and um, what, what are we going to do? And we're stuck in this real tension between yesterday, today, tomorrow, not really knowing where to turn our efforts. Um, I have no answer about what is preservation. Uh, what I feel is that what we're doing is part of culture and as such it should remain available to as many people as possible. Yeah, for me too, it's about uh, identity. Like, how can you have a point of reference to something about who you are and how you can reappropriate that? And I just think about literature or music. Th these things go in cycle. They're not just, uh, it's not just one, um, uh, one line ahead. It's, it goes back, it goes in the future, it comes back in the present. And how can, will somebody will reappropriate something that has been done uh, last week, but maybe in 20 years from now, and we saw that with video, uh, with uh, gaming, like how it, like the 8 bit, and came back as a, a real thing, not just a nostalgia. So, just to make sure that it's there to, for people to re reappropriate. And it's funny because right now there's, there's a bit in the, how can I say, a, not a, a panic, but maybe vertigo, like a lot of people. Montreal is a very prolific city in terms of digital creation and uh, its pioneers like but I, I find it quite impressive that Vincent just re, re, um, resuscitated Zig today but a lot of pioneer creators <coughs> don't have their work accessible anymore so what does it mean for people who are studying that are 19 20 21 years old they're studying uh, digital art for instance and they don't have any reference to the stuff that has been made in their own culture uh, 10 or 15 years ago so I think that uh, yeah it's uh, there's a, a necessity about the memory and the identity so what's missing how do you think we're gonna um, go about trying how would you within your organization who's re who do you think needs to be responsible for this from my perspective, and it's, um, I don't know to what extent, it is certainly a French perspective. We are <laughs> thinking about this in a specific, both legal and uh, economic model, um, meaning that um, we're not in a system of copyright, we're in a system where um, the uh, author's rights or any creative contribution uh, is handled again with the limited um, uh, limited license in terms of time and territories. Uh, this is linked also to the way these works are financed um, and, and to the fact that we made them available for free. So th th there is a tension between maintaining them available and financing them. So we need money, but we also need to reflect on uh, whose role it is to um, maintain them accessible, although maybe not pre-finance them. And um, another thing is um, um, the fact that um, a, a huge part of the sector in France is um, uh, contributed through the public money. So in a way, it's a crowdfunded sector um, through taxes or through direct contribution. Um, I would think I, I, I think it would be fair that the money comes from the same source. Um, I think it's possible, or it should be for the next two days afterwards. I don't know. Um, but um, that's a shared responsibility as the responsibility for producing these works is shared between broadcasters, uh, producers, public support. Excellent. Anyone else? Well, it, it takes leadership. Mm -hmm. And I hope that we will uh, put some efforts together. And I, what my, my um, uh, wish with that conference today and the workshop tomorrow is that people, the, the most important is not what's happening right now during the conference, but what's going to be hap happening when we're all going to leave this conference, because it's not just about, it's about very thoughtful things, but it's about ac action plan too. And I think that we can, we can put a couple of players together here uh, and have a, a leadership example and find, because you look at all, all the, 
all the resources and ideas and actual things already happening from you guys, from everything that happened before today. So there's al already a lot of uh, pieces of the puzzle there. So that is for me is very like uh, very motivating and optimistic. But we have to show leadership and work a bit together. Not everybody in their own uh, box, if I can say. Yeah, and like a layering of these approaches so that there's this redundancy or there's like you know, yeah, just kind of like an added sort of yeah protection and there's like all these different approaches to preserving it and then those things can kind of live together. Do you think there's um, that the value or the um, sort of role of preservation changes in a public institution versus private? You're both, you're private, private, public. Is there a different value towards preservation or a different uh, I'm sure there responsibility? Is. I'm sure there is. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in a way, I would, I Maybe would I'm, I'm I guess kind of I would jealous say. of what it does. Yeah. But obviously, the um, um, commercial stake is a really good incentive for yeah. being really active there. Um, on the on the past uh, yeah on the past nine months it was like sixty percent of the turnover of Ubisoft was made on the on the back catalog so like uh, relieving an experience of uh, inside a brain for instance Assassin's Creed we've launched this new movie but also there was a lot of players who didn't play the game but watched this movie like the movie wanted to play the game but not just the game the last one but the all the one maybe uh, that has been released. So uh, we had to remaster. Uh, we launched the Assassin's Creed Ezio collection remaster on PS4, but it was done on PS3. So we have to make sure that you have the assets available and everything, obviously, uh, to sell it, but also to allow to our uh, consumers, to the gamers, to relieve the entire experience and the entire brand. And this is something that is uh, interesting. So maybe um, bringing it back to Kat's question, does who wants to take that on about um, the legacy of High Rise and how you might communicate it and preserve it for future generations? Any thoughts? What would be the overall legacy for the whole project? How you might preserve that or, or communicate it? What is it? Any thoughts? I mean, what one good way, and it's not an answer to your question, is uh, Kat <laughs> telling about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a, I mean. Mm -hmm. We'll keep Kat. Over. Preserve Kat's <laughs> <is> it. <Yeah. laughs> I think we did talk at one point like it should be like a creative act, like it should be yeah, this sort of yeah gesture Classic. to. <laughs> Where is Kat? Kat. So in fact, Kat. Why don't we ask you that question? How to preserve me? <laughs> I don't know if it's possible. <laughs> no high rise. I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> and if it, that's it. No, but what are, you, what are you thinking about? If you could think, you know, preserve it and you want to leave the legacy, how would you go about it? Or what do you think needs to happen? Yeah, I think, I think there's several angles to this. I mean, there's definitely syst systemic questions that we need to ask about this work in general that I think all of you have really addressed and talked about today, and as everybody else has. But then I guess that's... It's that, um, as you said, the leadership and the, the, the understanding that the preservation is not just looking to the past, but to quote you, it's, it's about creating a creative vision of how to, for the future to look back. So in a way, it's, it's to, to arm new generations with, with what the lessons we've learned and the, and the things that have failed and the things that have worked so that they don't have to be repeated. They can be remixed. And, um, and that's, I think that's the biggest uh, inspiring creative uh, takeaway that I've had today. Excellent. It's also there while we're talking about documentation and it's key to make sure also that we describe not the final goal, but the way we went to there and like the whole process on this there, like where we're talking about not only content and preservation content, but knowledge preservation, which is key uh, to me as well. Yeah. It's actually documentation is very creative too. You have to get very creative of how you're going to document and what that means. So, right, we've run out of time. I want to thank you very much. Thank you. All wonderful. Um,